Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, it's great to see everybody. And um, uh, before the, the year ends, we have one more uh, uh, Dean's Lecture, and we're thrilled um, that we'll be able to get this under the wire in 2023 before 2024 um, is upon our doorstep. But we're so pleased um, to be here to, um, to honor and to hear from Craig Pollack. Um, as you know, these lectures um, are an opportunity for us to really learn um, from our um, newly appointed or promoted professors and our senior scientists. Um, you know, we have a backlog. I always explain this. We have a backlog, so some of them are not as recent, um, uh, but we still um, uh, love to hear from our, our professors and, and senior colleagues. Um, and these events are, um, I think you'll agree with me, they're always very inspiring, and you learn so much uh, about what's going on in the school. So I'm thrilled to have everybody here with us today. So Craig Pollock is um, the Katie Ayers Endowed Professor in the Schools of Nursing and in Public Health. He has a primary appointment in the Department of Health Policy and Management, but he also has joint appointments in epidemiology and in the Department of Medicine. He's also um, a practicing physician. Um, I'm delighted, um, actually, that Sarah Zanton, who is our Dean of the School of Nursing, um, uh, and thank her for her support um, of Craig as the Katie Ayers Professor. And as the Katie Ayers Professor, Craig's work focuses on the intersection of housing and health, which he'll talk to us uh, about today. He's dedicated to helping advance policies and ensure more people can live in safe and affordable homes. His work has been funded by the NIH, by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, as well as the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Now, as, true, as is true of many of our faculty here at the School of Public Health, Craig came to this field in a rather circuitous way. As an undergraduate, he majored in history, but was also a pre-med student. And he became interested in the language of memorials, particularly the similarities between World War I memorials and the memorials of those who had died from HIV and AIDS. He eventually traveled to Bosnia, hoping to study a new memorial honoring victims of a massacre. When he arrived, however, he learned that what people really wanted to talk about was repatriation. In a setting of great loss, Craig saw that people had a deep desire to return home, and that was their major focus. And for Craig, that really sparked an interest in the deeper meaning of home and how it is linked to our health and our overall well-being. Housing and health have been a common theme uh, to Craig's work for decades now, and that work is more urgent, as we know, than ever before. The US housing Situation is bleak, unaffordability, housing shortages and barriers to first-time first home ownership and renting are constantly on the rise. These trends have a tremendous impact on health. Patients make trade-offs, patients make trade-offs between paying for rent and paying for their um, medic medications. Unstable housing can lead to extreme stress, anxiety, as well as depression. As Craig puts it, people need a prescription for affordable housing in healthy neighborhoods to get at the root of their health problems. Addressing the health impacts of an ongoing housing crisis sound quite uh, daunting to most of us. But I know, and when we look at Craig's research, we'll see that there are solutions within reach. Craig has studied the health effects of housing mobility programs, which help families move from areas of concentrated poverty. He's also investigated the impact of housing affordability and place-based initiatives on healthcare use, spending, as well as outcomes. Many of the programs and policies he studies are designed to address the long history of racial discrimination in, in America's housing. And what's increasingly clear thanks to research, the research that Craig and others have done, is that these programs can result in substantial public health problems. Uh, I'm sorry, public health benefits um, that address the, the uh, public health problems. As we will hear today, Craig has been working on a study linked to the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership, whose voucher program has helped thousands of households move to less poor neighborhoods. 
He and his colleagues have been tracking the move's effects on a cohort of children who have asthma. They have found that housing mobility not only changes the allergens that children are expected, are exposed to, but also to their stress levels. Research like this is a reminder that our home determines so much of our lives. Things as fundamental as the air we breathe, breathe and the safety we feel, or in some cases don't feel. Clearly, the complex problem of housing demands multifaceted solutions, and we are so fortunate to have someone like Craig who brings a depth of diverse experiences to his work and collaborates so effectively across departments and multiple disciplines. Now, of course, this is just a small snapshot of Craig's research. He also conducts important studies on health disparities and the role of provider in patient social networks across the cancer continuum. He is also making an impact by nurturing others. He is dedicated to helping his colleagues, and he is known as a great supporter of early career faculty in both the School of Public Health, but also in the School of Nursing. I don't know where he finds the time to do everything he does, but he does. And in HPM, Health Policy and Management, he is the Associate Director for Research and Practice. The fact that he wanted this role speaks volumes about his commitment to leadership and to helping young professors build the beginnings of successful careers. Dr. Pollock, we are so grateful um, for all you've done and all you continue to do for the school um, and our strong collaboration with the School of Nursing. And of course, we're so grateful for your contributions to the public's health. And with that, um, I am going to turn it over to you and we're so excited to hear what you have for us today. Dr. Pollock. So uh, thank you, Dean McKenzie. That was a really lovely introduction and I'm gonna sit down now and that <laughs> we have time, right, for questions. We tested this right beforehand. And... So as Dean McKenzie mentioned, for the last uh, 20 years or so, I've dedicated my uh, career to studying how housing in place influence health and well-being in the United States. But my interest in this, as you mentioned, started about 20 years ago when I was a medical student working on a research project in Bosnia-Herzegovina. I was a student at Berkeley, and I was uh, interested in the language of mourning, the language of memorials. And I went to Bosnia kind of ready and, and willing to study what happened to memorials after a massacre that happened there. And when I got there, the, 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 the memorial wasn't being built. No one would really talk about it. The money had gone elsewhere. And instead, it really became about people's homes. And initially I was like despondent. I was like, but I came here to study memorials. Like, what am I gonna do? And so I talked to my advisors and they were like, well, like listen to what people are telling you, right? And I think that's always good advice. And the stories that I heard were really ones of homes and the meaning of homes. And so that's, that's kind of what's animated my work for, the, for uh, the last 20 plus years. Series of questions about what does it mean to have a home? Who gets to decide where you live? How do the political rules shape equity in housing? And how do we support housing and in doing so support health? So these are the questions and themes that continue to echo in my work. And these have played out in a lot of different ways and a lot of different uh, uh, approaches over, over the years. So the map on the top left shows the geography of mortgage foreclosure in 2008. At that time, around 3.1 million homes were foreclosed upon in the setting of a subprime mor mortgage crisis. And my time at, uh, as a fellow at Penn, I looked at what was the health impact trying to quantify the foreclosure crisis as also a health crisis. On the right, I've done a lot of work on housing affordability. This is a map from 2018 showing the rates of housing affordability and poor housing affordability in the United States. And unfortunately, if we were to look at this map in 2023, we would see a lot more darker colors, a lot more red, because the uh, housing affordability crisis has continued to, uh, to continue unabated. We've been doing work showing the link between housing and affordability and the trade-offs that families make in terms of paying for, uh, paying for their rent or paying for their, their food and paying for their medicines. And we've also done a lot of work showing the ways that different types of federal programs, such as housing choice vouchers and the low-income housing tax credit, 
uh, can help people uh, with housing affordability and in doing so support their health and well-being. And then the map at the bottom is indicative of some of the work we've done around COVID and the work that we're still continuing to do with Matt Eisenberg, uh, Aline Kennedy Hendricks, and others, showing the ways that COVID-related policies are related to um, around housing. This is particularly around uh, eviction moratoriums are related to a range of different outcomes and some of the lessons that we can learn from that. And so while I would love to go uh, through each of these different projects and approaches, time's limited. Keisha's already said she's going to cut me off in an hour. So I'm going to just focus on kind of one series of projects uh, uh, that kind of had its roots in my time in Bosnia that continues to resonate around where people get to call home. And so the basic research question that I've been asking is, what can we learn about health and well-being from programs that help families move from high poverty to more resource neighborhoods. And I have a number of studies that I'm going to go through. One, uh, Moving to Opportunity, where it's a completed research project. Another that we've been doing in partnership with the Baltimore Regional Housing Par Partnership, that's an ongoing project. And then the last one, our MOVE study, that's uh, just, in, in just getting uh, out of the gate and we're really excited about. So the question stems from maps like this. This is a map developed by Raj Chetty and colleagues that shows the average earnings in adulthood of children who were raised in different neighborhoods. They're children that were born between 78 and 83. And it's one of the many maps that shows kind of where you live matters for the earnings that you have as adults. And it's clearly correlated with underlying sociodemographic characteristics, but also distinct from some of these factors. And it asks the question of uh, how does where we live shape so much of who we are and who we get to be? In Baltimore, we can see this really distinct spatial patterning of opportunity very finely. Here, there's tremendous variation between regions of the country, but also at a micro scale, we can see that children who got, grew up in Baltimore had much lower earnings when they became adults compared to kids who grew up in the surrounding counties. A lot of my research, especially since joining the School of Public Health, has focused on this question, trying to understand what are the health impacts of growing up in these different neighborhoods and what happens as kids move uh, to their health and well-being. At the outset, I want to recognize that many of the ways this patterning of opportunity uh, reflects and is reinforced by systemic racism. This includes the systemic racism in the uh, homeowners loan corporation maps, so in the so-called redlined areas uh, seen here, which uh, showed areas that were uh, led to systemic disinvestment, um, but also by zoning regulations, restrictive covenants, the building of highway infrastructure, and the uh, resultant displacement of populations targeting subprime mortgages, and so many other factors within and outside of housing. And one way that's been reflected is in the placement of public housing. So on the left, you have the placement of uh, public housing uh, projects in the Baltimore region, uh, and the color-coded areas reflects areas of concentrated uh, uh, ra the racial composition, showing uh, highly non-white areas. And this underlying distribution of public housing is not at all random. On the right side, we have um, uh, a resulting lawsuit called the Thompson lawsuit, Thompson versus HUD. And it's uh, what's led to the housing mobility program in Baltimore City. And many of these other housing mobility programs that I'm gonna talk about were the result of other lawsuits like the Gautreaux lawsuit in Chicago. So what happened was that lawyers from the ACLU of Maryland, including the wonderful uh, Barbara Samuels, uh, sued the city of Baltimore and sued the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, saying that they were vi violating uh, the fair housing law and they were successful in their lawsuit against HUD. Here's what Judge, Gar Judge Garbus, Garbus uh, held in the ruling. He said that the HUD's programs, quote, failing to affirmatively further fair housing and for perpetuating, maintaining, and failing to disestablish racial seg segregation in violation of the Constitution and civil rights of a class of African Americans. So this lawsuit came out and said that they were violating fair housing laws. And as part of the remedy for that fair housing lawsuit, grew the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership, or BRHP. BRHP to date has helped about 5,500 families move with the aid of a housing choice voucher, which helps pay for the cost of housing uh, to areas throughout the Baltimore region. It provides extensive pre-move counseling help with the housing search, uh, and as well as post-move support to help families make this transition successfully. On average, the rate of poverty in their pre-move na neighborhoods were 28.9% uh, uh, compared to 9.2% uh, in their post-move neighborhoods. And so I'm going to show you a bunch of studies that give us some purchase on what was happening to the health of families in this and other types of programs. 
But I want to pause, because whenever I make this presentation, whenever I talk about housing mobility, there's always this question of, but like, why are you focusing on housing mobility? Like, shouldn't you be focusing on places? And I just want to say, I think this is a false narrative. I think it uh, leads to a zero-sum game where you can help people move or you can help invest in places. And I think we can and must do both. So I want to say that strongly at, at the outset, that one of my values is that people should not need to move in order to realize opportunity. Um, and I also want to say that the language of opportunity can be stigmatizing for some. When we're talking about moving to opportunity neighborhoods, we may be talking about like, then there's not opportunity neighborhoods that they're moving from. The reason I use often opportunity neighborhoods in these, in these conversations is because often that's what the policymakers are using when talking about these programs and initiatives. Um, I'll also use more resource neighborhoods to describe kind of the, the amount of money that's going into a lot of these neighborhoods uh, where people are moving to. I also want to say that I believe strongly in mobility-based solutions, that you know, there's a lot of choices that I enjoy about where I can live, and that these, structure, these choices are very much structured by a range of factors. The Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership has about 13,000 families on their wait list, and so this is about offering choices for people that want them. And I also think that the mobility-based research can offer real insight for some of the place-based initiatives as well. And that, again, moving away from an either or thinking that the mobility offers a kind of a window, offers a natural experiment, in some ways a randomized experiment to study these factors. And so um, it's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in them. OK, so I'm going to go through these uh, research questions. The first, looking at moving to opportunity. So moving to opportunity was this really amazing social science experiment. So, and, it's amazing because it's randomized, and there's very few social science experiments that uh, were randomized at, at this time. So it's a randomized trial that took about 4,500 families living in high poverty uh, neighborhoods, living in public housing in five cities. Baltimore was one of the cities. And it randomized them to three different treatment groups, either a control group, a traditional housing choice voucher. Uh, it was a Section 8 voucher at the time, kind of old name. Um, and then a housing choice voucher that they had to use in a low poverty neighborhood. And the experiment like didn't work that well, frankly. A lot of people weren't able to move with their housing voucher. And those that did move, a lot weren't able to remain living in their lower poverty neighborhood. But nonetheless, we saw significant health effects of families that were able to use their voucher. In particular, we found, uh, or uh, Ludwig and colleagues showed some significant reductions in diabetes and obesity for adults. And there were some mixed findings with mental health among children. We were interested in trying to understand what happened to the long-term health care use among uh, children and adults who received housing vouchers uh, relative to the control group. And for this, we linked different uh, data sources. We used all payer data uh, reported by hospitals to the state, including dates of hospitalization, discharge, hospital uh, charges, and the like. And the other was Medicaid uh, diagnoses for uh, Medicaid uh, beneficiaries and healthcare use. This gives you a sense of the five different areas that we, we got data from and the years since randomization. So kind of for California, we had uh, between one and up to 20 years after families were randomized to look at the long-term health effects. And this ability to look at the long-term health effects was, was really uh, quite unique. This kind of data linkage, like it takes forever. It's totally a pound of flesh to do, but I also think it, it provides wonderful opportunities. So some of the work that I'm doing with Dan Polsky and others is trying to continue uh, different types of data linkage to understand the impact of housing uh, across a range of different uh, medical conditions. So for this one, the main finding was that we saw that among children whose families received a voucher, here we lumped together the two different types of vouchers because their experiences of neighborhood poverty were incredibly similar. We saw a significant reduction in their rates of hospitalization. The lines look pretty close together, but they're also consistently lower among those that received a voucher, leading to significant reductions in uh, rates of hospitalization as well as hospital costs. When we look at this more uh, according to different medical conditions, we see that there was a really strong signal for asthma, that rates of asthma were over a third lower in the voucher group compared to the control group. And so that's one of the places where we wanted to go next, to dig into this finding around asthma. And so for this next part, I'm going to talk about uh, our partnership with the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership um, and our mobility asthma uh, project. And to provide a bit more context around asthma, asthma is one of the top three leading causes of childhood emergency visits and hospitalizations. 
and a leading cause of school absenteeism. And we know that asthma, the burden of asthma, is not at all evenly distributed. Its prevalence is quite high, about a quarter of kids in poor urban areas. And uh, uh, non-white children are much more likely to have asthma and much more likely to have severe asthma leading to emergency room visits and the like. The spatial patterning of asthma is similar to some of the maps that I showed earlier, kind of similar to the black butterfly that people talk about in, in the Baltimore City area, showing that rates of asthma uh, really vary across zip codes. And I think one of the fun things about a lot of my projects is I get to work on a lot of different types of health conditions. And so a lot of what I'm going to been, been telling you and what I'm going to continue telling you about asthma are from things that I've learned from my colleagues in the pediatric allergy and immunology world. And so their understanding of asthma is really that, that environmental drivers are a key factor. So mouse and uh, cockroach allergens are some of the key drivers of the uh, asthma prep or asthma uh, exacerbations in Baltimore. And we also know from them that home interventions have had somewhat mixed findings. So you go in and you try to vacuum the home, you go in with bed covers, you go in with air filters. And those uh, types of mod uh, home modifications have pretty typically modest impacts. You're not able to uh, obtain a very uh, sustained reduction in asthma triggers for a very long period of time. It's really difficult to eradicate uh, mouse and cockroach exposures uh, in inner, inner city uh, Baltimore, according to the studies they've done. And so what we were interested in is, in light of what we've been hearing from our colleagues in the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership, in light of what we found with the Moving to Opportunity Study, to what extent does helping families move to trying to address the root cause of uh, structural racism lead to reductions in asthma exacerbations? And so the Mobility Asthma Project is a prospective cohort of 123 kids with asthma who are enrolled in the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership. We started recruitment in July 2016 and, uh, and continued through the start of COVID, continued up again, as I'll talk about later. And we focused on kids five to 17 years of old who had persistent asthma or were having an asthma exacerbation in the past 12 months. We excluded kids that we weren't likely to see a change in asthma as, as they moved, including those with smoking history and, and the like. So these slides are to give you a sense of some of the homes. They're not the actual homes of our research participants. They're from a, a, a website that people use to find housing with their uh, Section 8 voucher. And the top is typical of the type of row house that's uh, common in Baltimore. And the bottom are some of the houses uh, in the surrounding counties where some of the families are likely to have, to have moved. For data collection, this uh, has been quite intense. We did a baseline home visit with the families and then repeated home visits every six months. Uh, we, our outcome measure was the, uh, whether the child experienced exacerbations in the past three months as well as a measure of their maximum symptom days in the past two weeks. We did like vacuuming in their house to get their allergen levels, indoor particulate matters, uh, PM 2.5 and 10, lung function via spirometry, and then just a range of survey measures to get at potential mediators. You can see here the demographic characteristics of uh, the sample. Uh, about half were female with a mean age of about nine years old. Uh, they were uh, by and large black, and about half were sensitized, uh, or about 60% were sensitized to any of the different allergens at baseline. This map shows where they lived uh, before they moved. And you can see here that they lived uh, largely in Baltimore City, largely in high poverty neighborhoods. So the average or the median income was around $32,000, and uh, about 87% of the population was racialized as black in their neighborhoods. And the map on the right shows where the families moved after they moved, uh, with a median income of about $83,000, uh, median percent back black of around uh, 19%. And this slide is the main effect. You can see here that the sample on the, uh, or the bar on the left is the average uh, uh, rate of exacerbations in the last three months before they moved compared to a significantly lower rate uh, after they moved. So a 54% reduced odds of asthma exacerbations within the year after they moved compared to the time period before they moved. So this is a really striking result. And I, you know, just to put it in context, 
it's an effect size that's larger than a lot of the medicines that we give to kids who have asthma. So it's larger than the effect size or in line with the effect size that we see with corticosteroids. And it's also in line with uh, what we observe for biologic agents. We did a lot of different uh, approaches to like compare it because we know pre-post is subject to a lot of biases. So we had a, another sample called Eureka that we compared it to, gave them all a pseudo move date, and the results still held. One of the things we were really interested in is to understand why was this happening? Is this just related to reduction in mouse and cockroach allergens, which would have the implication that we really need to double down on trying to remove mouse and cockroach allergens in people's house, or is something else going on? And so this shows the change in asthma, in asthma allergens. Uh, along the left, you can see mouse, cockroach, cat, dog, and dust mite allergens. And I want you to focus on the right, which is the percent change associated with moving. You can see that mouse uh, allergens had a 50% reduction. Cockroach allergens went way down. Some of the other allergens, like dog and dust mite, went way up. We then did some mediation models to try to figure out what is this what's going on? Is this what's uh, mediating our, the observed association? And we found really nothing there. And I think we have a bunch of different explanations for why that might be. Again, there's like a large body of evidence that suggests that these things matter. Some of it might be that we were seeing uh, allergens moving in different directions. So the mouse and cockroach going down, but some of the dust mite, which can also trigger uh, uh, asthma exacerbations were going up. It might be that not enough were sensitized to really see an effect of moving. And if we wanted to look at an effect of uh, sensitization. We should have just recruited kids that were sensitized at baseline. Um, so kind of, again, these factors are important, but weren't the key drivers here in this sample. Instead, I want to focus on some of the other factors that we collected. Here, looking at the stress measures. And you can see that uh, some of the measures that we were looking at in terms of neighborhood factors, like social cohesion, feelings of being safe in your neighborhood during the day, and feelings of being safe in your neighborhood at night, Went, uh, went way up. So uh, 66 percentage point increase in the rates of reporting being safe uh, at night. Uh, depression went down, uh, as well as experiences of discrimination went down. I think the experience of discrimination, I just want to pause here for a second, because I think a lot of times when I talk about uh, mo mobility programs, one of the things I hear is that like, but people are going to experience a lot more discrimination as they move. And I would say that our data, in at least in the short term, doesn't bear this out. Um, and then we also looked at uh, stress uh, measured by the Kessler sex. We then plugged this into mediation models. And here we found that there was really significant uh, association and really significant mediation. So social cohesion, daytime safety, and nighttime safety each uh, mediated about a third of the effect of moving on asthma exacerbations, similar findings for asthma symptoms. I should say here that like you shouldn't, I know many people are probably like adding these up in their minds being like, wait, this is more than 100% and there's negative mediation. Like, what does that mean? So all of these are separate. We recognize that like experiences of social cohesion and daytime safety and nighttime safety are all highly correlated with each other. We did test of these in separate models um, and the negative uh, mediation, people assure me, is like a sign that there's not real mediation there. <laughs> um, so again, it focuses on kind of the role of stress and it's particularly the role of neighborhood stress as opposed to like changes in and individual mental health as a potential intervention. And so I think there's several potential reasons and thoughts what, what might be going on here. The first is around kind of an inflammatory response that there's a lot of research to suggest that like stress can change the inflammatory response associated with asthma and can also change the response associated with treatment of asthma. So kind of like stress gets in the body in really fundamental ways. We also think that stress may be associated with health behaviors like smoking cigarettes. We tested, uh, tested markers of nicotine exposure in the house and didn't see that as, as a huge, uh, huge factor in here. It's also possible that feelings of neighborhood safety allow kids to spend time outdoors. We're doing some more work to look at this kind of where are kids spending time during the day to kind of further refine that. And then the last part is around healthcare access, that feelings of stress and safety can uh, potentially contribute to people being able to access healthcare. We didn't see huge changes in people's use of controller medicine, so we don't think it's just about that they were like increasing their medicines, and so that's what was driving the change that they were getting better, better medical care, but I think it's still uh, part of the pathway. So our takeaway from this is really that moving through, uh, through the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership was associated with huge reductions in asthma uh, symptoms and asthma exacerbations, and that stress, and particularly neighborhood stress, is one of the key factors. And I think, for me, it kind of makes me think about what we're doing to address asthma in, in our society. 
And a lot of the programs that we have in Baltimore are really these piecemeal programs designed to kind of address the exposures in people's homes uh, without addressing some of these fundamental issues around neighborhood safety. And so I think it causes us to uh, think carefully about whether that's the right approach or whether there are other approaches that can be built, built and developed around these more holistic uh, approaches. So uh, we uh, were lucky to receive a continuation of our R01 to continue following these children. We re began recruitment uh, in uh, November of 2021 and so far have about 77 families that have continued to uh, follow with us. Again, for the first part, we followed them for about 12 months after they moved. We wanna understand whether these effects are sustained over longer periods of time. This map that we have here is a map of uh, forced expiratory volume in, in one second or FEV1. And what I was a little sad to learn from my colleagues was that our uh, lung function grows and then in our mid twenties, or starts to decline. And that right now, none of the medicines that we use actually change the rate of lung function growth. And that peak, that level that you get to is really important in terms of your risk of developing chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, your risk of dying and the like. And we're starting to see some signal that there may be a change in the slope. There may be a change in lung function growth among the kids that were given the chance to move with their families. If this is true, that has really big implications for how we think about lung function growth, how we think about kind of how uh, neighborhoods get in the body and for long-term outcomes for these kids. So we're excited to do kind of better lung function testing in this new sample and see whether or not that pans out. We're also uh, in the process of getting Medicaid data for our sample as well as the 5,500 families that uh, moved with Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership. Our application was just approved by the IRB. We're going through the Maryland IRB. This kind of data linkage takes forever, but for students and people out there, we'll have data six months to a year to a couple years, <laughs> but hopefully soon. Another way that we've been really excited to build on this work is through something called the Healthy Children Voucher Demonstration. So the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership received some pilot funds that uh, we supported their application from uh, Kresge and others to create a program that says, you know what, we think moving helps children and their health. So is it possible for us to recruit kids from, uh, from healthcare facilities who might benefit from moving? And if so, like, what would that look like? Can we provide the mobility counseling? Can we, um, can we work with them in order to you know, achieve these beneficial effects for, uh, for their children? Not only is this, a, I think, a, a really important program for Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership, but it's also a great collaboration between them and the housing authority. And to have them working together for these types of programs to say like, okay, well, we're gonna use the housing authority voucher and then we're gonna um, provide this mobility counseling is really is a really novel approach and I think, uh, I think great. So they have uh, funding for about 150 uh, for kids to receive mobility counseling for their families and to help them move. And here on the Hopkins side, we've been evaluating this program. I would say this part has been going slow and a, a little bit slower than I would like. And I think a lot of us would like. And I think for me, it re reflects kind of how we're thinking about collecting social need data uh, from healthcare systems and how we're partnering with them. And so this is an area where I'm excited to continue to move and explore. And I would say there are several lessons that we've learned from the first year of this type of recruitment. Um, and type of offering of this program. And the first is that data sharing agreements are really challenging. So the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership has had to enter into data sharing agreements with the different healthcare providers. You would think, oh yeah, that's easy. You just do one at Hopkins and you're good. Well, it turns out there's different one at uh, Harriet Lane Clinic, that's a pediatric clinic and the pediatric emergency department. And like, there's just lots of different like uh, nuances and that's been taking a lot of time. I think the second lesson is that that these types of programs really would ideally be incorporated as part of a broader social determinant screening. And I think we're starting to roll those out in our clinical practices, but I think they're not universally done. And when they are done, they're not always getting at kind of like, who are the right people for this program? It's hard to have a bespoke program when uh, clinicians are facing so many different uh, social needs. So for this program, people need to have a housing voucher already in place and then be interested in moving. And so finding those, uh, finding those families has been a, a little bit challenging. And so that speaks to kind of that third of like, okay, you have the screening in place, how do you screen exactly for these people and refer them so that like clinicians can have that information at the point of care um, and to do it well. So we are still trying to crack 
this nut and still trying to work with Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership to make this as successful as possible. We have some conversations coming up with some of the Medicaid uh, managed care organizations because they, I think they have a lot of information about the, the kids that they're, that they're um, covering that are having emergency department visits for asthma and the like. So we think that uh, could be an exciting opportunity. Okay, the third project in this, in this will be relatively quick because we have absolutely no data. <laughs> so uh, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, is uh, launching a new program called the Community Choice Demonstration. With about $50 uh, million allocated from Congress, they are doing a new program to try to help families move uh, into opportunity neighborhoods. In many ways, this is uh, moving to Opportunity 2.0, kind of building on the lessons of Raj Chetty and others that uh, housing opportunity matters. They want to see what are the services that, that can be provided that help families really move, recognizing that there are a lot more best practices out there than there were at the time of moving to Opportunity. Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership is one of those examples of the best practices. It's been really successful in getting families uh, to move and helping them remain living in less poor neighborhoods. So they're doing a randomized control uh, trial across about nine different neighborhoods involving about uh, 10,000 households. You can see the different cities that were uh, selected for this, uh, for this community choice demonstration. And so building on that, we have the MOVE study or the moving uh, mobility opportunity vouchers to eliminate disparities. As I'll talk, we're doing a sample of about 900 families across three different sites to investigate changes in uh, obesity and diabetes risk. As I mentioned, I like working across disease uh, conditions as a general internist and partnering with others who are real experts in this area to look at what happens uh, as, as families are given the chance to move, uh, collecting baseline information and change. We really want to understand some of the mechanisms at play here by collecting a bunch of data that I'm going to talk about in just a second, as well as doing uh, qualitative interviews in an unstructured data collection. So as I mentioned, we're doing uh, data collection from 900 families in three different cities, Nashville, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland, baseline and two-year follow-up data with an adult and child survey. We're going to be collecting uh, child weight and height as well as waist, waist circumference. Uh, we're collecting blood samples for A1C and doing blood pressure. We're doing accelerometry uh, measurements on about 400 uh, families at baseline in the adults and children and, uh, and during follow-up. And then we're doing an interview, interview or home assessment, um, as well as a neighborhood assessment and qualitative interviews with 75. We have a ton of different topics on the survey. So these are just a few of them. We're going deep into the mechanisms of obesity and diabetes, looking at physical activity and nutrition. Uh, again, thinking about the neighborhood safety, which is such a key finding mobility uh, asthma project. We're gonna go, uh, go deep into that as well. Looking at mental health and substance use disorder, healthcare access, transportation, social networks, social support and discrimination, as well as uh, sleep, which is a, another area of uh, big interest of the NIH. These uh, topics are all finally decided. So uh, working with, um, with HUD and with, with our contracted uh, data collection agency, it's all gone through the Office of Management and Budget, which is another uh, whole process that I'm happy to talk about. Um, but we are excited that we think it's going to get through that process of, uh, of review, hopefully at the end of this year with a launch of our survey in February. So in conclusion, housing mobility programs both provide a policy intervention that I think is a really important policy intervention and a window into the pathways to study the connections between housing, neighborhoods, and health. We saw from the first project that there's long-term and robust changes in healthcare uh, use for children over the long-term. For children, uh, we also saw that there are significant reductions in asthma as they move. Thinking about it in a holistic sense, we think is incredibly important. And these types of programs, I think, are continuing to be used and continuing to be uh, thought about. This is a, a notice, a press release from HUD just from a week or so ago showing that uh, a number of cities, I believe it was seven cities uh, uh, received, or seven public housing authorities received funding for a new housing mobility program in the order of $25 million. So again, both as a policy approach, as well as a window, I think that these types of mobility programs offer some real novel insight and I think are incredibly exciting to be able to partner with, uh, with, with them and the public housing authorities 
to, uh, to try to assess their impact. So I want to end just by taking a moment to thank many of my mentors and sponsors uh, over this very, very long journey. Uh, these include my sponsors and mentors from my time as a medical student and graduate student at Berkeley and UCSF, um, my time at, at, at Penn when I was a Robert Wood Johnson uh, clinical scholar, and then uh, across my journey here at Hopkins in general internal medicine and HPM and the School of Nursing. Um, and as I mentioned, all of this work is done in partnership. So these are some of the teams and some of the individuals that I've been really lucky to work with and learn from. And it's, you'll see some of the same people across the different teams, a lot of different uh, people where like kind of expertise is, is kind of just all these projects emerge out of these kind of conversations and wonderful uh, colleagues. Um, I'd be remiss if I also didn't talk about some of the trainees that I've been really, really privileged to work with uh, over the years, both general internal medicine fellows, PhD students in the School of Nursing and School of Public Health. And, um, and then just want to do a plug for our house, uh, Hopkins Housing and Health Collaborative website's going to be updated soon. But if uh, we have monthly meetings where we bring in speakers, so really we, we designed it to be a small group where people can kind of exchange ideas and really learn from one another, uh, develop uh, some new projects along the way. And I want to end with one last map, which was uh, my wedding invitation, uh, as uh, showing where my husband and I met on BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transport, and then uh, moved cross country where we got married in Massachusetts, where it was legal at the time. And um, it's my two daughters, uh, Mike and Sadie, and so very grateful for, for them and their support. So thank you. Craig, that was terrific. Um, my name is Keisha Pollock Porter. I have the great privilege and honor of being chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management, and I'm sure you can see why I'm so honored that you're a part of the department. I'm going to facilitate this next part of the session, which is really the Q&A. I want to invite those online. I know there are there's almost 80 people online, although we see just a handful of faces, to raise your hand if you'd like to get in the queue, or feel free to send a chat to Becky, who's monitoring the chat. And also, if you're in the room, please raise your hand. Um, we have time for questions, because you did end on time, so thank you. All right, we'll start over here with Caleb. Uh, thank you, Craig. That was wonderful. Great presentation. Oh, I wonder thanks, if Becky. you had um, old job, um, what you would do. In other words, you spoke about one thing HUD does, and uh, I and perhaps many others know next to nothing about HUD and the various levers that they can pull uh, that affect housing and health. And uh, I imagine that HUD has lots of potential ways to influence housing policy beyond these important programs that you've so rigorously studied. So, um, and maybe someday you would have Ben Carson's old job. So I'm just curious what, what you can say about HUD policy and um, where you think there's opportunities for HUD to make a difference beyond the uh, moving uh, programs. So that's a great question. And I would say that um, after HUD had one physician from Hopkins, I'm not sure they're gonna have another <laughs> anytime too soon. Just my guess. <laughs> um, so I think one thing is to kind of frame HUD as, as, as a program. So housing assistance, as opposed to so many other types of federal assistance, is not an entitlement program. So what that means is about only a quarter of people that are eligible for housing assistance actually receive it. In Baltimore, the wait list for housing assistance is something like 80,000 households. It's something enormous. And what happens is that they open the wait list for a week or two weeks at a time a ton of people sign up and then the housing authority closes it because they say, you know what, we know we're not going to make it through, you know, more than these individuals. And when we, you know, our list gets low, we'll open it again. And so this is not something that Ben Carson or the current HUD secretary has at their, their disposal, but I think kind of advocating for increasing the amount of housing assistance and increasing the supply of affordable housing is, is really, really critical. So I think like the demand side of it by having vouchers as well as thinking about kind of what are the supply side levers that can be can be done to in, increase housing assistance or increase uh, housing for low income populations is really critical. And those a lot of those are not the so the funding is not in HUD control. And also a lot of the kind of policies are to increase the supply of affordable housing 
are not in HUD control. That could be ranging from increasing the supply of low-income housing tax credit, which is a, an IRS program, to thinking about local zoning policy, um, to some of, you know, kind of working in your neighborhood around NIMBYism uh, to try to address NIMBYism as new projects are being developed. So I think those are all kind of outside of HUD. Thinking about within HUD, I think there's a lot of opportunity that HUD is actively working on in their policies and regulations to try to kind of make sure that people have opportunity, uh, access to opportunities. Uh, some of that is like, it's kind of wonky, but it's like changing the way that they pay for housing. So a lot of times they kind of pay for housing across a city and you know, your voucher goes further in poor neighborhoods than it goes than it, than it does in richer neighborhoods. And so there's been a move to have uh, small area fair market rents, which says, you know what, like in places where it's more expensive to live and maybe where there's more opportunity, we should have our vouchers pay for more money. And so those types of things I think are, are incredibly important. And um, I also think there's a lot of moving in movement in terms of like leasing up just because people get a voucher. As I mentioned, like not everyone who's eligible gets a voucher. For those that get a voucher, not everyone can use it. Um, and so helping families uh, more effectively use their vouchers is, I think, a really big focus uh, of HUD, and uh, rightly so. I think they, you know, people are kind of winning the lottery ticket in this and want to make sure that they can actually, you know, cash in that ticket. Any other questions in the room? Thank you, Dr. Malik. Um, I was wondering specifically with regards to the mobility project, what do you see is the role of community members or community organizations who are doing similar work in doing things like the, the counseling, or have you seen ways in which they've been able to do this already, or do you see a role or a gap that could be addressed by existing organizations as well? So that's, that's a great question, and I'm not sure if folks online could hear it. It's a question about kind of what's the role of community organizations in these mobility programs. So I think uh, there's a lot of different roles. And so the program that's in Baltimore grew out of uh, the fair housing lawsuit and is really just a phenomenal community-based organization, right? Like they are, their hearts are in the right place as opposed to like, I was just at their holiday party and they were saying that their kind of lease up rate for their, their folks in that program was incredibly high, right? Like they are successful in getting, helping families use their vouchers, helping families move to uh, less poor neighborhoods. Um, and it's really a community program, right? Like they have a board, they have the, they they have all of the, you know, the, the factors associated with it. And I think that it's really important that, that they are leading this, uh, this effort. You see it in other cities too, like Houston, and uh, where they have, you know, a community-based organization that's doing this work. Sometimes uh, the work is also done out of housing authorities. So HUD is working with housing authorities and those uh, may be more bureaucratic. And I think there's a, you know, always this question of like, how much of the work should be done in house and by governments versus like, you know, contracting out, if you will, to different organizations. And that's, um, that's a hard question. And I think maybe it's gonna vary across different uh, places and the effectiveness of the different organizations. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Support. Um, any online? Are you seeing Becky? No? Okay. Any other questions in the room? Dan. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed the, the talk so much. And I, I, I was just focused on the slide on, um, you know, this mobility versus place-based solutions. And for me, it's a little bit, uh, you, know, you learn so much from studying mobility because it's more you know, it's like a shock to the system about where place-based solutions might, you know, be needed, where the focus is or the need for place-based solutions. It, it seems like to just, you know, you know I, I guess I would fl flip it a little bit is it, in, in terms of what to do with your results isn't just to do more mobility-based solutions because the, the, the numbers, the people they affect, it's great for them, but it's like winning the lottery. It's not a lot of people, but if you invested in these place-based solutions, uh, addressing some of the challenges that seem to have the greatest impact is identified by the experimental evidence and mobility, that it might be much more cost-effective in terms of the dollars affecting many more people. I, I, I'd be interested in just understanding the denominators of the people influenced by mobility versus, it just seems like a small fraction of, 
of the people in need that could actually be addressed through mobility. So just to put a plug in for place-based solutions and, and the importance of your research in um, shining a light on where that focus might be most uh, effective. So I, I appreciate that comment. I think that you're right that, that mobility-based solutions kind of so far to date have affected relatively few families relative to the, the need, right? Like, and for the families that it, it affects, it you know, has profound influence and I think you know, profound health influence as we're showing. But I think there are implications for place-based solutions that you're right, could have real you know, kind of exponentially larger effects. And for me, it kind of raises this question of like, so you know, as we focus on, on neighborhood safety and social cohesion, how do you implement that in a place-based solution? And that's a place where you know, I would love to learn from some of my colleagues in the School of Public Health about kind of how do, how do we kind of implement some of these factors that we think are gonna be really, really important, recognizing that they're not easy and that they're, that, that, that they're gonna require kind of an, a, a village to do so. Read a question. Okay, the question is, if housing mobility was achieved and people were able to completely move out of these neighborhoods, what would the effect be on the neighborhoods people moved out of? As well, what would the effect be on the people who remain? So it's a great question. I, again, I think this kind of, it's like taking that kind of mobility versus uh, place-based and saying like, not only is it first, is it's like, it's really like, directly in conflict, like right? Like the any sort of mobility-based solution is going to lead to kind of a loss of individuals from neighborhoods and lead to a furthering hollowing out in ways that you know I think is going to be damaging uh, for health. And I would say that I, I think the mobility programs as they're currently uh, kind of imagined are not big enough that that would be a, a huge threat in terms of like kind of the number of people from any given neighborhood that that move as part of these programs. So I, I you know I appreciate the concern, but I think it's at least at this point, more theoretical than in practice. Um, but I think it's something to kind of bear in mind if these were to really scale up in a way that, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that they're going to scale up in that to, to that extent at this point. Um, and again, though, I would say that, right, like the goal here is to offer opportunities for people to move if they want to, right? Like to offer the opportunities that my family just moved, right? Like we took advantage of that and, you know, offering people to kind of overcome some of the barriers that prevent them from moving while at the same time making it so that they don't need to move in order to realize opportunity. Great. Looking around the room for other questions. All right. Um, I had a like kind of a follow-up question, but when looking at um, mobility programs, how do you um, like make sure that they're sustainable for the people that um, are participating in the programs? Because you'd mentioned that one of the programs had um, people like weren't able to sustain their lifestyle after being placed for the three categories that you mentioned. Um, how does that then impact somebody's health if they have that mobility, but it's not sustainable for them or for their family, and then they have to end up moving back to um, high poverty levels? So it's a it's a great question. I think I don't really know like what what is what is the you know health impact of people that move and then need to move back. Um, we have not studied that. I think and we've been lucky working with the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership that we that hasn't been a big part of their study because again they are very successful in helping families move and remain living. And one of the ways that they do that is kind of through some of the pre-move counseling, help people overcome and figure out like what are the barriers going to be, right? Like they've helped a lot of people, so they have a sense of like, is it going to be around transportation? Then how do we help get you kind of access to different sorts of transportation? Is it around credit scores? Well, we need to help you with your credit scores. Is it around relationships with landlords? And we need to kind of work with you around some of these uh, these types of issues. And then kind of checking in with families after they move to make sure that, that, that their unit is meeting their needs, that they're kind of addressing problems. Like if there's something with the landlord that's not working out, that they're able to help intervene. So it's, you know, really, I think in my mind, like the kind of moving back after families move is right. It would be really, really challenging, I imagine, for many of the families. And so kind of how do we support what are the best practices that are available to support families kind of in this, you know, kind of our, our new understanding of the ways that mobility programs um, you know, can and should be implemented.
Uh, thank you. This was so interesting. I'm, I'm curious, the examples you gave, they're all in kind of major metro areas, right? Nashville, Cleveland, et cetera. Thinking about this from like the rural health perspective, um, I'm curious if you think there are any insights from your work on what this means for communities that might be more rural and might similarly have challenges kind of moving to where they want to be that gives them a healthier life or opportunities to be healthier. Uh, so it's a great question. And um, I don't have a lot of insight into the kind of the rural ha housing landscape, except to know that, that you know, you would think that housing in rural areas would be a lot more affordable, right? Like there's more land, there's less, you know, but it, from what I understand from my colleagues that work in this space, that housing affordability continues to be a large challenge in many rural communities. And so, you know, there are specific HUD programs, specific programs to try to address some of the um, kind of lack of housing affordability in rural areas. And people are working and advocating on that. And it's not an area that I've, I've done a lot of work in, but I think it's incredibly important. Hi, <clears throat> thank you for your talk. Um, uh, was there anyone, any family that moved uh, like within the city? So instead of going out into the suburbs, stayed within the city. I'm just really curious in seeing whether these changes could prevail um, when the density is still high, but like you, you, you have a move to a um, high opportunity area within the city versus to the suburbs where the density is lower. So it's a great question. Like, can you separate it? Is this just a factor related to density or is it related to poverty? And often you're right, like it's hard to disentangle these different factors that are all often related. We did see that there were some families that, that live in different parts of the city. The new kind of uh, healthy children demonstration is largely in the, in the city of Baltimore and to different neighborhoods in Baltimore due to the fact that like the housing authority of Baltimore City has their vouchers like all within Baltimore City. And I, I suspect that we'll see an Im impact, but we have not specifically looked at that because we don't have the numbers as of yet. But it's a great question. We probably have time for one more question. Or, was that, is there a hand? Oh, Matt. Thanks so much, Craig. This was a great, great talk. Um, when thinking about the the mechanisms in, in, in the reductions in, in asthma and the improvements in health that you spoke about, have you examined potential income effects and the uh, the idea that the voucher frees up some money to perhaps spend on health promoting activities or or healthcare? Yeah, it's a great great question. So we did look at that, and so the way that we looked at that is about half the families in our program had vouchers at baseline, um, and about half didn't. And we looked and again; the like sample gets small when you divide it in half. But we look to see, is there any signal? Is it, does it look different you know, between asthma exacerbations and asthma symptoms among people that had a voucher at baseline versus those that got a voucher newly? And I thought like, clearly there's gonna be an income effect, right? Like clearly there's gonna be a big impact of getting a voucher, freeing up money, all, all of those things. And in fact, it, it didn't seem to be that at all. The effect, uh, the magnitude of the effects were really, really similar for both groups. So again, we don't know for sure. It wasn't like randomized in that way, but we suspect that that wasn't what was driving the association that we observed. Great. Well, please join me again in thanking Craig um, for such a great and inspirational talk. Thank you to um, everybody. And Again, thank you to everyone online who, who joined us and lots of um, affirming comments in the chat. We'll, we'll get those to you so you can um, look at what everybody's sharing with you. And for those of you who are here in person, uh, we will continue our time celebrating Craig at a reception out by the Wall of Wonder. So um, sorry for those of you online who will miss us, but if you're on campus, come on over. We'll be at the Wall of Wonder. And thank you again for being here today, everyone. Take care and happy holidays. <laughs>